Hey, it's Professor Gould. In this section, we're going to talk about different forms of reproductive isolation. Um, so now, reproductive isolation is some kind of mechanism that separates a population into two species so they cannot mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. We categorize these rather depending on when the mechanism works, a prezygotic barrier is before the formation of a zygote. Remember, a zygote is a fertilized egg. So that's something that prevents mating or prevents the fertilization of that egg. And then a postzygotic barrier is something that prevents that embryo or fetus from developing or something that makes the hybrid individual sterile. So horses and donkeys have a post-zygotic barrier. The mule can grow up into a perfectly healthy individual, but it is sterile. So there is a post-zygotic barrier between horses and mules. Okay, um, so uh, post-zygotic barriers, we're not gonna really talk about those. Um, they're a little more complicated uh, than this class, but we have lots of pre-zygotic barriers to talk about. The first is temporal isolation which is a difference in breeding schedule. So if you are reprodu reproductive when something else that otherwise would be a sp in the same species is not reproductively um, active, then you can't breed together. So the, author the apple and hawthorn maggot flies that we talked about in the last lecture, apples and hawthorns actually bloom at different times of the year. So when some flies made their way to apples, they were actually laying their eggs at a time when the rest of the flies weren't reproducing. And so there is a temporal isolation between these two populations because they're literally reproducing at different times of the year. Um, temporal isolation also happens uh, in these frogs where they breed at different times of the year. So, um, Often with a temporal isolation, these separate species, if you bring them into the lab, they can produce fertile hybrids, but in the wild, because they aren't available to each other at the right time, they are a separate species. Like I said, there's not a clear line, okay? It's, it's complicated. Now there could also be habitat is isolation meaning that the two species live in the same geographic range, but live in different habitats within this range. So the apple and the hawthorn could be an example of that. Um, another is these two species of crickets that live in the United States. They have different geographic ranges that overlap, and inside that overlapping territory, there is a hybrid zone where hybrids do form, but rarely. So here's the map of these two cricket, cricket species, Gryllus pennsylvanicus and Gryllus firmus. Um, you can see one is more northerly, one, one is more southerly, and then this dark area in between is the hybrid zone where the two ranges overlap. But even within that range, these two species of crickets live on different kinds of soil. So they're, they can interbreed, but it's really rare that they do. So this is the uh, female and the male of Gryllus pennsylvanicus. This is the female and the male of the um, Gryllus uh, firmus. And then this is what the hybrid looks like. And you can see that it actually has a, a phenotype as well as far as size that is in between the two other species. Okay. So would these two be considered separate species? If we only looked at them within this hybrid zone, we might say no, except that the offspring, they're fertile, but they're, they look really different, or at least a different size from the adults of either other species. So again, it's complicated, but they don't hybridize very often because they're using different types of soil within the same zone. Okay, we also have behavioral isolation, um, which means that just by virtue of the kinds of mating, like displays or mating call, that 
two groups of organisms don't recognize each other. Um, there are a lot of species of fireflies in the United States, and I'm so excited to be in Ohio where there are fireflies because there aren't any in California. Um, but different fireflies flash in different patterns uh, to attract the males flash to attract the females, the females flash to say, yes, I like you. Um, and that is a behavioral isolation. They can live in exactly the same area, but they won't breed together because they don't recognize each other as the same species because of that flashing pattern. Uh, there is a, a pair of species, uh, both of which are fairly common in the United States, where the females flash a pattern of the males of a, the other species uh, to attract the male that they then eat. Um, I am going to post a video about firefly flashing that is actually pretty cool. So watch that as well. Now, there can be gametic barriers, difference in uh, the gametes that prevent fertilization, like the, something about the uh, coating or the jelly coat on an egg doesn't react to the sperm. Again, these are complicated and beyond the range of this class. Um, there are very frequently phenotypic barriers so that even when um, two different species, like behaviorally, they will try to mate, but literally the genitalia don't fit together. So it turns out that with insects, geni genitalia is really complicated. Um, and in fact, several species of insects can only be distinguished by the genitalia. Yeah, I know. So these are damselflies. Damselflies are kind of like dragonflies. And you can see that there's a lot of variation. Um, these are all different species um, in the male genitalia. Uh, and the female genitalia is only going to be able to fit the male genitalia of one species. Like if this guy tries to mate with this female, that the female that matches this, it's not going to fit. Like it's literally not going to fit. So uh, that would be a phenotypic barrier um, that would obviously prevent uh, an actual mating. With plants, a lot of plants have flowers that are adapted to very specific pollinators. So for example, um, long, narrow flowers can be pollinated by either hummingbirds or bees. But if the flowers are really narrow, then the bees can't get in there. They're actually too fat, too wide. I shouldn't say fat, that feels judgy. Um, but the hummingbirds have these long tongues that can get into that very narrow flower. So this is a phenotypic barrier in the flower that prevents transfer of sperm from the wrong kinds of flowers. So that's a way that a plant can prevent being fertilized or have wasting time and energy on the wrong kind of sperm. All right, so those are all of our prezygotic and postzygotic barriers creating reproductive isolation. In the next, we're going to talk about some mechanisms that keep genes moving around among populations and that may help to separate populations.